we're going to be taking a look at basic head injuries and how to bandage those. Keep in mind though, these are basic head injuries. This is not concussions or traumatic brain injury, but these are lacerations and some bleeding to the scalp and proper ways to bandage those up. We're gonna be talking about lacerations and bleeding to the scalp and how to properly bandage those. There's some tips and techniques that we can use to properly bandage those and make sure that pressure is applied to those areas so that we do get good uh, clotting and that we don't end up breaking those wounds open. So, But I do want to tell you first off, we're not gonna go into concussions, we're not gonna go into uh, skull fractures, we're not gonna go into traumatic brain injuries. That's gonna be something we cover in a future video. Right now we're talking about isolated injuries, hematomas, bruising, uh, lacerations, abrasions, that kind of stuff to the scalp. This is external injuries to the head. This is not anything that's affecting the brain or anything that's much more serious that we really need to look into. So isolated injuries, we're not going too much in depth on this one. One more thing that I think I should point out, if you have a head injury, these are serious. Don't just assume that it's just external because you see blood. There could be more things going on inside. There could be brain damage or brain injury. There's a lot of other things to take into consideration here. So just because you see blood doesn't mean you can go through some of these techniques and that person is completely fine. There is some other diagnostics and possible CT scans that need to take place. So don't just assume that because you can bandage something up that that person's completely fine. So I'm gonna show you how to do bandaging in this video, but make sure you seek proper medical care and treatment if someone has or has sustained a head injury. Before we dive into exactly how to bandage these wounds, let's talk about what different types of wounds we may encounter, and let's talk about the terminology that goes along with each one of those wounds. First off, let's talk about an abrasion. So an abrasion is when you have an open wound in the skin, and that open wound is usually caused by some sort of friction, like a road rash. So road rash is a type of abrasion. You can have um, a lot of different things that can cause an abrasion, and some people even call these scrapes, but it's gonna be something that breaks the surface of the skin, but it's not a straight cut, or it's not a flap of skin, but it's actually um, a little bit more mangled. It's scraped across the surface, and that is what we call an abrasion. When we are treating an abrasion, and particularly on the scalp, typically these are not gonna be very deep, they're more superficial, could be a good bit of bleeding. We're gonna try to flush these wounds if possible with some saline or some sterile water. And then we wanna put some uh, gauze or bandaging on there, hold some pressure, try to minimize the bleeding and wrap that in place. These are not very deep, superficial wounds, really just pressure for some bleeding, try to get the wound cleaned as much as possible. And then we'll wrap that to keep it clean and to keep that pressure on there for clotting. So the next category we're gonna talk about is swelling and bruising. Now, while these are different, I'm gonna put these in the same category for a minute um, so we can talk about how to treat these. A bruise is broken blood vessels inside, and we start to see some discoloration, some purple, some blue, eventually some black, and then it gets real gnarly, it starts turning brown and all sorts of fun colors. But that bruising is broken blood vessels from some sort of impact or injury, and we're gonna see some discoloration from that. That may also be accompanied with either a um, large hematoma or some swelling. A hematoma is swelling of blood. When a blood vessel is broken and not just a bruise underneath, but now we actually have blood pooling underneath. So there's a large amount of blood now. It's starting to push out. We call these a goose egg or something on your head if you have um, the blood there that's pooling out. But you also can have just some isolated swelling from an injury as well. Swelling is when the body is trying to heal a particular injury. It, forces a bunch of um, extra blood and white blood cells and everything to this injured area. And then that extra fluid that's in the area starts weeping out into the tissue. You have this increased swelling there. So any sort of swelling, inflammation, a little bit of bruising, that's kind of what we're talking about in this category. And these are closed wounds. There's no active bleeding outside the body. So what we're gonna do for these to help minimize some of the swelling is we can apply ice there. The ice will actually cause some of those vessels to constrict down, less blood flow in that area, which keeps some of that swelling down. 
While you put ice on for a little while to keep some of the swelling down, you don't want to do that for an extended period of time. It will help keep some of the inflammation and pain at a minimum because there's not going to be as much pressure from the swelling, but you don't want that over long term because you do need increased blood supply to that area to allow that area to heal. But initially, we can throw some ice on that to help minimize some of the swelling. Next injury I want to talk about is a laceration. These are pretty simple. It's a cut. It's a cut. It could be shallow or superficial toward the surface, or it could be deep. So these cuts are just a line usually. It may be a V cut. It could be two lines that come together, but it's pretty simple. It's just a cut, whether it's shallow or deep, it's a cut that now needs to be dealt with. So we are going to treat these with either direct pressure if it's superficial. If it's deep enough, we may need stitches or staples or something. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later in the skills side of things. If it's deep enough, it does need some sort of wound closure to hold that together, to allow it to heal so that that tissue can actually grow back together. Um, we're not as worried necessarily on scarring um, in the hair area because you do all have hair to cover it up. But if it is on the face, we are worried about some scarring. So we do want to pay a little bit more attention to those and those would be a prime candidate for some sutures and stitches to make sure that that gap gets closed so there's not as much of a scar and it's not as noticeable for these lacerations. The next thing we're gonna talk about are punctures and penetrations. While a puncture and a penetration may not be as big of a deal on an extremity, we have to be really careful when it comes to the head because you don't have to go very far before you start getting a brain matter and some really essential organs and things. If we have a puncture or penetration, we do want to make sure we know how deep it went in. We want to know um, what all is involved so we don't just slap a bandage on top of it, but we have a skull fracture or something else with that. But a puncture and a penetration is basically just, it's not a, usually a large injury from the outside. It could be, but typically it's not. It goes deeper than it really does wide. So a laceration is gonna be a long cut. A penetration is gonna be a smaller area, but it has deeper penetration into the body or into the head. Next up is an avulsion. Now an avulsion is like a laceration, but really it's when you have a laceration in a U-shaped or a V-shaped. So now you have a flap of skin that comes off. So if you have a flap of skin attached on one side, cut on three sides, so there's actually a piece of skin that is loose from the rest of the head or the rest of really anywhere, um, that flap now is what we call an avulsion. So if we're talking and we say, hey, we have an avulsion on this laceration on the back of the head, that's gonna be a flap of skin. So an avulsion is a prime candidate for sutures or stitches or staples or something like that. We've got to make sure that flap stays down on top. It keeps that wound covered. It allows that skin to grow back into the other skin. If we leave that loose, it can stay detached. It won't uh, regrow, readhere. Um, now we have more potential for infection. We won't have hair grow back in that spot. A lot more complications. So definitely if we have an avulsion, we want to make sure that gets sutured down or stuck down in some form or fashion so that 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 skin is not coming back loose. Last but not least, I want to talk about deformities and skull fractures before we go any further. I'm not going to be teaching you how to deal with skull fractures in this video, but I do want to touch on it because it's very important. If you're doing an assessment and you're going to slap a bandage on this wound and cover it up and get it wrapped up, you need to check for skull fractures before you do so. When you're checking for a skull fracture, you're looking for deformities or something we call crepitus. Now crepitus is when bones rub back and forth against each other. And that's a pretty bad sign, especially in someone's noggin. But when those bones rub back and forth against each other, some people liken that to feeling like gravel underneath the skin because you're having these hard surfaces that rub back and forth. So if you feel something that feels like rocks hitting each other or gravel moving, we call that crepitus, and that's not a good sign. So if you have major deformities of the skull, if you have fractures that you know about, if you have the crepitus movement when you're palpating and trying to figure out the, how bad the injury is, we want to take special note to that. And we don't want to start putting pressure bandages and putting all this pressure on there. Because if you put pressure on that skull, skull goes into the brain, put pressure on the brain, we have issues. So be really careful and be watchful for that. Head injuries can be very dangerous and very scary in a lot of ways. There's a lot of things to know and we're just scratching the surface in this video. So don't get too crazy. Don't start doing a lot of pressure bandages and things. But if it, you know it's isolated and there is no skull fractures, then we can go ahead and run into some of these skills that we're gonna talk about next. Let's run through some of the skills for bandaging head wounds. Before we jump into all the bandaging, let's talk specifically about eye injuries, since eye injuries are on the head. 
So if we have a penetrating eye injury, let's say we have an object that's still sticking out of the eye. So when we have penetrating trauma to the eye, we wanna make sure we stabilize that in place. Any further movement of that object can cause further damage inside the eye. You don't want that person looking around all over the place and that object moving around because it's gonna cause more damage. And as we're stabilizing that object, now we need to figure out some way to hold that object together. One of the best methods for this is to use some sort of cup, a styrofoam cup, a paper cup, plastic cup. Okay, so I need to measure this so I'm going to just estimate exactly where this needs to be I don't know how you exactly estimate but we're gonna do it so I'm gonna go ahead and cut this we can poke a hole in the bottom of the styrofoam cup slide the pencil through that cup and now we have a little cavity around the eye that protects the eye stabilizes the pencil on the far end and then we can wrap that in place with some gauze okay go ahead and hold this for me okay so have someone hold the cup in place so it's stabilizing this object, and now I'm gonna wrap this. So when we wrap this, I'm using a pressure bandage. You can just use regular gauze, but this is gonna come around the top, and then I'm gonna come around the bottom, just like that. So now this is stabilized. It's got the uh, penetrating object stabilized, so it's not gonna move around anymore. And also notice we covered up the patient's other eye. We wanna cover that eye up because the eye is tracked together. And so if we didn't cover that one up and we have one stabilized, if that eye, if they're wanting to look at what we're doing or looking um, around, that eye is gonna move to one side and that object's gonna wanna move with it, thus causing further damage inside that eye. So we wanna stabilize it. We wanna have them close the other eye. We wanna bandage that in place so they're not looking around. Let's talk about lacerations or bleeding on the scalp. So anywhere on the scalp, if you have bleeding, same thing applies as anywhere else, pressure. Put pressure on there, that's gonna slow the bleeding and help that to be able to clot off. So initially, bleeding on the scalp, let's put some pressure on there. Again, make sure that you don't have any skull fractures, but if this is an isolated injury of just a laceration, we can go ahead and put some pressure on there. Once we've applied that immediate direct pressure, then we will start to figure out how we're gonna bandage this. So remember, a dressing goes directly on top of the wound and a bandage actually holds that dressing in place. So we have a dressing, we have put that on the wound, the wound is now dressed, we've applied pressure. Now we're gonna bandage that in place with some Curlex or some sort of wrap to hold that in place. So if it's on the forehead or the back of the head, it's pretty simple. We just wrap around with some Curlex, we secure that in place and our job is done. That's fairly straightforward. But what about if we have a laceration or bleeding on the top of the head? We don't want to go from the top of the head up underneath the chin because now we're putting pressure on the airway. So what do we do to hold pressure and hold dressings on top of the head? So we have two options we're going to use. The first one I like to call the George Washington, and you'll see why in a minute. What we're going to do is we're going to go back and forth across the head. Um, if you need to, you can place ABD pads or 4x4s or something on the wound first, put direct pressure, and then this is going to go on top of that. So we'll just go back and forth a few times. And now we're going to take another roll of gauze and we're going to start from the forehead and we're going to wrap around the head. We're going to come across the back, back around the forehead, and we're going to wrap that several times to where it's really firm and secure. Okay, I'm going to tuck that into place and now I'm going to take this side. I'm gonna take this side. I'm gonna give a good snug pull down. Again, this is stretchy, so it'll take me several pulls. I'm trying not to pull her hair. Several pulls to try to get this snug down well. We can grab these ears that are hanging down on either side of the patient's head, and we're gonna pull them down snug. Snug that down on there, and now that's gonna hold pressure on top of the head. So we go back and forth on top of the head and then we're gonna wrap around it to hold it in place and then just snug it down and that holds good firm pressure on top of the head. So that's one method to be able to bandage a laceration or bleeding on top of the head. The second option for applying a dressing or putting pressure on a laceration on the top of the head is to put your dressing on and then we're gonna use a triangle bandage or a bandana or something of that form. We're gonna put it on almost like a do-rag. So we're gonna put it across the front, we're gonna tie it in the back, and that's gonna go over this middle flap. Once we have it tied securely, then we can pull on that middle flap and pull that down to put some pressure on the top. Between these two different ways to bandage lacerations on the top of the head, I've had a lot more success with using the gauze, the George Washington style back and forth. So that's my preferred way. Um, I have seen other people use the uh, triangle bandage, so that's another option. It's another tool for your toolbox, another thing to keep in your back pocket. Maybe you find it beneficial to you at some point.
So the last thing I want to address is a laceration or avulsion on the scalp that may need stitches. First off, remember that scalp lacerations are prone to bleed a lot. There's a lot of vasculature in the scalp, so there's a lot of little veins, arteries, these types of things, a lot of potential for bleeding. So we do want to control that bleeding first. So if we have a deep cut, deep wound, we want to control that bleeding. Once the bleeding has slowed or almost stopped, then we can start addressing the actual wound. Well, if it's deep enough, we want to make sure that wound is clean. So we want to try to flush that wound with some sterile water, preferably some saline. Saline would be great if you can get your hands on some. Um, you can find saline for irrigation, so if you can keep some of that in your med kit, um, that would potentially be the best thing to use. You don't want to use dirty water. Don't just take random creek water that could have contaminants in it and start just pouring that in there. But you do want to try to get that wound clean. So some sterile water would be great or some saline. Flush that wound. You can't flush these wounds too much. Get all that dirt and debris out. Um, the body will naturally try to help get some of those contaminants out, but it would be best for you to try to flush most of those ahead of time. So flush it really well and try to get it really clean before you move any further. Okay, so we've got a deep laceration or an avulsion. We flushed it well. It's free of most of the debris. If there's big chunks of things, use some tweezers, pull that out, you've got to get it clean. But now that it's clean, let's move on to how do we actually manage this injury now. Well, the cool thing about having this injury where there's a bunch of hair is we've already got a bunch of threads attached to our scalp where there's an injury. So when someone may say, hey, we need some sutures or we need some staples or we need to close this in some form or fashion, rather than having to shave the head and put stary strips or um, start doing a bunch of sutures or staples to the head, an easy way sometimes to address these injuries is to literally tie the hair together. So if we have a wound and we're gonna start tying the hair together, we want to start in the middle of this wound and start closing this wound up. We want to try to bring that back together so that skin grows back together, it closes that wound, it protects it, and then we're gonna start in the middle and start tying that hair. As we tie that, then we'll start moving back out toward the outsides, trying to tie this in several locations so it holds that together. Just keep tying little strands of hair from either side until you think that wound is close enough together. But again, we want to make sure that's clean before we start closing so there's not a bunch of stuff trapped inside of this wound. When you're tying the hair, you're not trying to get individual strands of hair. You're trying to get a couple from one side, a couple from the other, tie them together. Overhand knot is great. Do an overhand knot, tie it again, and do that a couple times to hold that in place. Um, the hair sometimes has a tendency not to knot well and come apart, so I've seen some people put a little bit of Derma Bond um, or some sort of super glue or something on there just to hold, just dab of it, just to hold that hair together so it doesn't come apart. But this is a lot more of a, uh, or a lot less invasive way of being able to pull lacerations and avulsions back together rather than having to do sutures or staples or something else on the head. So. Little tip or a trick, if you've got real short hair, it's not gonna work. You may have to go get some sutures. So I'm throwing out a tip or a trick to be able to use the hair to close these wounds. If you have short hair, may not work. You may have to go get sutures. And again, I'm not advising anybody to skip going to the doctor and just try to take care of all this stuff yourself. I'm merely offering some information out there. So the safest bet is always to go to the doctor and have them take a look at it and give you antibiotics if you need it and all that fun stuff. But I'm just offering this out there as information that may be helpful. So that concludes our video for basic head injuries. We will touch on some of the more advanced things like traumatic brain injuries and concussions in the future. But for today, that kind of covers the lacerations and some of the hematomas, bruising, um, and some more of the minor injuries. So if you found this helpful, we would really appreciate it if you give us a like on this video. Leave us some comments if you have any questions about this or want to see any future content um, on this channel. This video actually was a recommendation from someone in the comments. We threw this together for them and posted it here. So if you have any ideas or things you'd like to see, we'd love to hear from you. Click a subscribe over here so that you will get updated on future videos. And as always, stay vigilant and stay safe.